Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about seed saving and what you can save and what's good to save and what's not good to save. As well as the problems that we face with our tomatoes this year in the garden. And we have fermentation expert Jane Campbell on and she's been a fermenter into fermenting for at least 30 years if not more. So we'll talk with her. As well as questions from callers via social media, listeners, and that all starts right now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for now containing over 1,000 garden videos, short and long format, as well as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all previous episodes of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show and highlights of each segment. And the program is brought to you by all the great sponsors you hear throughout the show, and especially... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it, because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nasala.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us during the show and post-show. And any time during the week, uh, you can call us on the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard hotline to, to co- talk to us right now. Ivy Organic 3 one Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn insects and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shield and pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in to 414-444-5250. Anytime during the show, you can also email us at twvgradio at gmail.com or you can send us a tweet at hashtag TWVG uh, with your com- comment, your question. If you have a, hey, what's wrong with this, try to attach a photograph. It makes our identification process a whole lot easier than trying to pa- piece together pictures from words that you've given us. Well, we uh, concluded our t- uh, garden talks for 2017. We were at Cedarburg Public Library uh, this past Tuesday where we talked about growing great garlic. Had a good turnout there. We want to welcome those who are listening, as well as this past Thursday was our final talk at Brookfield Public Library on Basics of Canning, and we want to welcome those individuals who are now tuning into the program. And again, if you missed anything, uh, if you, this is the first time you've tuned into the, the garden program, go to the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, click on the radio tab, and you can find all 29 previous episodes in studio video, as well as full-length downloadable uh, podcast form shows. Uh, a couple of notes we want to make aware of. Uh, our current supporting sponsor this year, Root Assassin Shovels, is uh, now available on at walmart.com. Uh, they have already re-upped for next year. They're advancing their sponsorship support to an advocate sponsor next year, and we can get more into that at a later date. But uh, you can just go to walmart.com and type in uh, Root Assassin, and it will pull those items up. It's a, it's a shovel that's got blades on each side of it that you can actually cut through roots while you're digging. And also, the, the videos show that you can actually cut limbs off a tree with this shovel as well. That's uh, why they call it a root assassin. Now, I know some of you may not like Walmart because of a variety of different reasons, and that's personal preference there. But again, Walmart's giving Root Assassin the opportunity to sell their product through their website, which gives Root Assassin employees a job and support their family. And in turn, they are able to support us in, in this show and allow us to come to you each week. So we're happy to uh, ha- put, put that announcement across. So with that being said, let's talk about seed saving. Uh, seed saving is something that we can all do. It's not as difficult as you might think it is. There are some difficult seeds and plants to save seeds from, and we'll get into that. But we're going to go over the easiest ones here, and then we'll talk about w- the ones that are harder and what you should do in that situation. So let's start with uh, the easiest one, I think, is beans. Yeah, I was going to say beans is probably the easiest. You essentially just let them dry is what you do. Um, you let them dry out. Your green beans, forget about picking them, and maybe you have, <laughs> and they've turned brown on the, on the vine, and then you can 
pop them out of the shell. Now identify these things because some, if you have a variety, like I, last week we discussed, we had a question come in. I think we grow six or seven or eight different varieties of pole beans, bush beans, that type of thing. And then there's hard shell beans, the, the kidney beans and the pinto beans. That's a whole other realm too. So you want to mark what you got so you know but, what you're getting. Right, definitely. And you're going to, the hard shell beans, you're going to let dry anyway. Right. So you might as well, you know, take a handful or whatever you think you might need for next year and set it aside. But the beans, you want to let dry completely on the vine. Don't pull them off green like you're going to eat them, like green beans or yellow pod beans, and then try to let them dry in the house. doesn't work that way. You want the seed to be as mature and as large as possible. So that's the that's so, easy way. And on that note, peas is very similar. Peas are extremely yeah. similar. Again, you want the largest peas. Uh, we had that problem this year. We saved some peas last year that was smaller than what they should have been. And we lacked in the germination uh, success. They, they just didn't germinate very well because the, the actual pea, which is the seed, didn't have enough viability in it to grow. So let your peas get very large and, and do that, as, so well as, as well as okra. Okra yeah. is the same way. You want to harvest those pods small, you know, three, four inches at max. But if you want seeds from them, let that sucker grow as big as it will possibly grow and let it dry out on the plant, and you can get your okra seeds that way. And our okra plants are doing fairly well. Right. Um, we'll talk to William Moss here. He's coming up on the program in two weeks, uh, and he taught. He said, you know, grow okra, grow okra. Uh, in Chicago, he was unable to grow okra because they've had almost 20 inches above normal rainfall, and okra is not a big fan of a lot of moisture. It needs some, but it likes the heat and some dry weather. And we've had that here, but Chicago didn't get that this year. Right. So uh, I would say then, aside from beans and peas, uh, peppers are very easy to save the seeds. You basically just take the them from the inside, let them dry a little bit, and then you have your pepper seeds. Uh, to get the best, the best chance, allow your pepper, uh, pepper to set on the plant until it changes a red or a uh, purple or a yellow, because we are trained as a society to eat green peppers, which is a technically an immature or unripe pepper. If you let them sit in the refrigerator, they will change. If you set them on the counter in a, a, a week or so, they will change color. Right, but, but some you want people, them, right, but you want them like seeds. the green peppers. Right, but in order to yeah. get seeds that are the best possible, let that plant, let that fruit go until it's completely changed colors. And that's for jalapenos, that's for jolokio peppers, that's for the hot, you know, the, all these extremely hot the peppers. Butch tea or the butch ghost tea, pepper or whatever. Yeah, ghost right. peppers, that's uh, it's the, all across the board. Let it grow to complete maturity. And then harvest the seeds from it. I think one of the most familiar ones that people don't even think about is pumpkin seeds. People do this anyway when they are, you know, if they decide to carve a jack-o'-lantern, they might save those seeds to eat them. It's the same thing if you're going to save seeds from a pumpkin or a squash. That's the same concept. You're, you're not going to roast them, but you're going to clean them off. You're going to let them dry, and then you can have them for next year. And, and that's the thing. You want to know the variety, assuming, you know, a jack-o'-lantern, is a jack lantern okay? It's a big yellow, a big orange pumpkin. It was it, when somebody is saving pumpkin or using pumpkin for a pie or some sort of cooking. They're typically not using jack o' lantern pumpkins. We have tried the jack o' lantern. Right, pumpkin. it's, it's not stringy. It's stringy. Yeah, jack o' lantern pumpkins were are bread. The way, they're bread designed to be more hollow so that you can, and larger so that you can and less meaty so that you can carve them. Um, so if you want to save the, the pumpkin seeds. It's very easy to do. We saved some, some Jardel pumpkins, which is a blue skin pumpkin, mm -hmm. um, which we bought the seeds like six, seven years ago. And, this, and we planted them last year in your sister's backyard. We had seven seeds left, and these seeds were far past the prime of good ver uh, germination. We planted the seven seeds. We got two seeds to, to, to go ahead and grow, and we ended up getting 45 pounds of pumpkins, three different pumpkins, total of 45 pounds, out of the backyard. And then we've saved those seeds, and those are good, bulky, thick seeds, so we know that they're a good chance uh, they're going to grow again, and they have. We did plant some this year. Uh, additionally, if you're going to save, um, like, zucchini or other squashes, you want to make sure that, the, that there's not a chance that it's going to cross-pollinate because... Squashes and pumpkins and squash are all in that kind of same family. So if a pumpkin crosses with a zucchini, it will grow a, a I, I forget what the terminology is, but it's a cross between a zucchini and a pumpkin. It's a very odd looking shaped mm. uh, vegetable and it sometimes has a good taste and sometimes it doesn't. 
So if you have that chance that it may be a cross, just get new seeds. So real quick, since people are growing a lot of tomatoes typically in their gardens and or want to save the seeds, especially the more <clears throat> heirloom varieties, t saving tomato seeds does take a little bit more work. It's not a ton of work, but you have to let them, as, as you know, when you have a tomato, they have that slime around the seeds. And you basically have to get rid of that slime. And the easiest thing to do is take whatever tomato seeds you want to save, put it in some water, put it in a, a like typically glass jar, put a paper towel or something coffee over filter. it. Coffee filter. And in a few days, it'll kind of ferment almost, but not quite ferment. And then at that point, you can take them out, put them on a paper towel, and then they'll remove themselves from that slime. Well, put them on a, a ceramic plate because the paper towel will stick to the seed. Okay, so yeah, ceramic uh, But plate. what you're doing is that gluttonous slime that's on the tomato seed, that is actually a permit a, a barrier that nature has put on those tomatoes because in nature the tomatoes drop off the vine lay on the ground and that slime protects it from germinating this year and it goes into a dormancy state and the next year as the winter and the, the that slime works off or breaks apart it's going it's going to be too cold in the winter to grow and then in the spring it germinates and that's what that slime represents uh, on the tomato seed, and that's why we're wanting to get it off so the seeds look like what you buy at the store, the, the little hairy seeds, and they're all dry and they're ready to go. Uh, radishes are real easy to save as you let them go to seed. Uh, that green pod is edible, and then you let that pod set on the vine and turn, until it turns to almost like a cardboard state, and then you can save those seeds. Each pod contains five, six, seven seeds uh, on that. And then same thing with lettuce. You can do the... There's something that's similar as well. When, when we say go to seed or bolt, that means the plant has done growing its edible portion and it's put in a, a strong center stalk and flowers appear and that's where the seeds will eventually uh, grow from or develop into uh, on that. So that's what we mean by going to seed or, or, or um, uh, you know, that type of thing, so, uh, uh, going to seed, yeah. Right. So then there are some plants that are... I well, we want to let, let's talk about corn real quick. Okay. Oh, yeah, corn. Uh, we don't grow corn, and for a variety of different reasons, because we can buy corn, heirloom organic, GMO-free, all that stuff, corn, for like a quarter an ear, and I cannot grow it that cheaply. We have successfully grown it, and there are videos on our website that indicate how we were able to successfully grow it. Once we accomplished that goal and made the video and felt that we had done what we needed to do, then we decide no more, it's, it's too much work to grow what little corn we have space for in our backyard when we could buy it for a quarter of an ear. But if you're going to save corn, you want to go ahead and let it harvest it from your crop, or if you get it from the farmer's market and you can find out that it's a non-GMO heirloom organic variety and you can get a name of it, just take that ear, open up the, the husk on it, the green portion of it, and then... Uh, let that set in the open air and let the kernels dry out and then you'll flake it off and you'll put it in, in an envelope and save it for next year's planting right now some of this heirloom corn in my gardener has all the seeds at 99 cents okay you don't have to worry about there that's why we recommend going there some of these other heirloom seed companies what you buy at mi gardener for 99 cents they're charging five six seven dollars for the same amount of seeds from some of these other corporations. But anyway, well, that's, that's, that's another story for another day. Let's talk about the ones that are really hard to save. And we would recommend going to migardener.com and buying these seeds fresh. And I talked to Luke, the owner, yesterday, and he said that the store should be restocked. They've cleaned out the store this year because, by law, they have to get rid of all the old seeds. The, the store will be stocked by November 1st for 450 varieties of new heirloom organic flower vegetables and herb seeds. And, and real quickly, uh, if you're looking for a gift from a gardener, don't buy them another shovel. Cause <laughs> go, go to the store, 99 cents a pack, buy them a bunch of seeds. Uh, they will be much more appreciative of that than the 14th shovel in the 16th year of you know, Christmas. Okay, just buy them seeds. Or like a trowel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great, I got another one of these. Wonderful. Just buy them some seeds. Here are some seeds that are very difficult to save, and there's some reasons why. Cucumbers. Cucumbers, if you let the cucumber go to a full mature state, it's going to turn yellow and the seeds are going to be usable for the next year. The problem you have with that is if you're growing a variety of different cucumbers like we are, we're growing 10 different varieties, the problem is they will cross very easily and you're going to get a morph variety. So it's just better just to go to MI Gardener and buy. Start fresh. Start fresh.
Um, yeah, so definitely. And then other ones include onions and leeks because those are biannual. They'll take not if you let your onions and leeks stay in the ground this year, if they're not stressed, they're going to go to dormancy, regrow next year, and then put that flower seed on. So it's easier just to save or just to buy the seeds. Carrots are the same way. Um, anything in the brassica family, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, very difficult to save because those are biannuals and uh, just easier to buy the seeds. Strawberries, it's not about saving the seeds necessarily, but it's about um, the germination, the germination. Of it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just buy the starts or what they call bare roots, or you can actually get what is called uh, harvest the daughter plants off the parent plant. We've done that. works very well. And then potatoes, you would just want to start that from this from a... A seed potato because you, there is if you have diseases in your soil and you carry those over those and you're, there's ways to save them and if you carry those potatoes over to the next year you can reintroduce those problems into your garden beets are biannual Swiss and then char is well. a biannual uh, so you have to wait two years in order to save those seeds if the plants are not extremely stressed this first year so hopefully that has helped you uh, we encourage you to try those easy savings seeds. Uh, with the tomatoes, if you go to the farmer's market, you can buy an heirloom variety tomato that you think is real pretty and, and, and you want to grow it next year. Ask for the variety, and then you can save the seeds from that. Perfectly fine. Just don't do that from the uh, grocery store uh, in, the, in the generic tomato variety at the grocery store. That's not good because you don't know anything about it. You talk to the farmer at the farmer's market, and they will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. So with that being said, we're going to talk about tomatoes in just a moment when we come back and the problems that we have faced with our tomatoes, what we are going to do different so uh, we have a better crop and what you can do so you don't have the problems we had right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit greenstockgarden.com. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh loose carrot juice. The health food stores hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. Hi, I'm John Lee Wendowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening year-round. Uh, over 1,000 garden videos, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, replays of the radio show, and digital magazines, a whole lot more. Well, we're almost to the end of the peach season, but we still have peaches that are being drove up from tree-ripe.com from uh, Georgia. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches, sweet, juicy blueberries. 
Um, definitely not the lackluster and missing out uh, produce that you get from the grocery store. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. For location and schedules, visit tree-ripe.com. They have locations all over Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. And in the winter, they have the uh, citrus. Yeah, they think they'll have the citrus, even though the hurricanes came through. Um, they believe they're still going to have citrus uh, come this winter. Well, what we have had problems this year with, and maybe you have not, and I uh, applaud you for that, is we've had problems with our tomatoes. We grow approximately 38 to 42 varieties of tomatoes, somewhere in that uh, realm. I think under the tool tab on our website, uh, there's uh, on maybe the tomato tab, uh, we've list all the tomato varieties in which we grow and whether they're determinate, indeterminate, and the days to, to, of maturity. So that's a little guide there. And you have to explore around. There's so much stuff on our website. I really have a hard time remembering everything that's there. But we had a number of problems that happened to them. We did everything that we felt was right. Um, come this spring, if you remember the spring way back when, it was extremely wet, extremely muddy, and we essentially, in the farmer's terms, we mudded the stuff in. Right. Because there was a certain That's, time yeah. we had to get it in. Memorial Day weekend is really the guide of where we shoot for. Uh, we have planted them as late as the first week in June. Well, it was extremely wet, extremely muddy. You, we were fighting rain showers to get them in, but we put them in the ground. Things looked good. Well, they've got, they grew to what I thought was a good state, and they just never did put on the foliage that I thought they should have. They, they were just very thin-looking plants. Well, we ended up with uh, early blight to begin with, and even though we did the necessary precautions, uh, there was some early blight that developed on these plants, and that's really what's going to happen no matter what, unless you have a solid barrier between ground and soil. Early blight is uh, bacteria or fungus that splashes up from the soil onto your lower leaves of your plant, changing them from a green to a yellowish spotty color, and then the plant progressively dies from the bottom up. The leaves do. You can prevent that or greatly reduce that by using yellow whole grain cornmeal, which we did, and we had a barrier of leaves and dry grass clippings. It, draw, it, it reduced it by, you know, 80, 90 percent, but we still had some, and we still had to continue to trim those dead uh, limbs off, as well as keeping space between ground level and about six to eight inches up the plant. So we, that, that we definitely does, that. Yeah, yeah, that does help with early blight, and as Joy had mentioned, the trimming and the mulching um, uh, can help. However... Our, then as we got into the the summer. Uh, well, we didn't have, the only problem we really didn't have was blossom end rot. Right. We which, yeah, what, we definitely didn't have that. Blossom end rot, for those who are not familiar, is you harvest the red tomato and you flip it upside down. And there's a big black spot on the bottom of it. That occurs when there is, the plant is not able to pick up the calcium that is in the soil to help finish developing the tomato fruit itself because it's too dry. The plant can't access the, 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 the calcium. You'll see this a lot more uh, in container gardening than you do in traditional ground gardening or raised beds because there typically is moisture if you regularly water. Uh, the only problem, we did see it in our containers a little bit, but uh, otherwise that early spring, that early development of the fruit, we didn't see it that much, but that's what blossom in rot is on your plants. Okay, so then as we got into the summer and as things, uh, our, our weather changed a lot. Dried we out. From, yeah, hot to cold and then cold to hot and who knows? And so, uh, but then things started to dry out, and this is where we saw a lot of the problems. Well, we made the mistake. We've got an irrigation, drip irrigation system, and because it was so wet in the spring, we decided, you know, we're not going to take the, the day and put it all in because, you know, it was just wet. wet. Why put an irrigation system in when it's just completely mud and, and rain every third day? Well, it turned off, and we gambled wrong on that, and that greatly, that, that hurt the production of the tomato plant. And as we always say, you know, we, we make mistakes too, and we learn from them, and I think we definitely learned from that this year. Well, then we, we had the drought, and then we began to see spider mites and, and white flies. And what are, white flies is a telltale sign something's not right. What, right, what, white what, flies will essentially come out and attack your plants when things are not good. It's kind of like when you're not feeling well and you catch a cold, your immune system is down, and it's kind of like that for your, your plants. So the, the plants were already, like, dealing with the drought, so that was strike one. And then with that stress of the plant, white flies came, and that was um, a strike two. And then we had spider mites, which are microscopic little spider uh, insects that weave little webs 
underneath the leaves and start eating holes in the leaves. So that was strike three. We mm -hmm. have got tomatoes off the plant, okay? It's not like, but last year we were getting 10, 20 pounds a week off. This year we were getting five, six, seven pounds a week off of the tomatoes. Then we also have some spottiness on the tomatoes, some fungal problems, as well as we are developing late blight, which is... Well, late blight is actually an, an airborne fungi um, that exists. In, in the area and it can it travels through the air so if you do get late blight you definitely want to remove those plants you don't want to burn them you don't want to put them in your compost you want to basically put them in your trash the reason why you don't want to put late blight plants in your compost or in the city municipal or on the street for the city for the, them to pick up and compost is late blight uh, the, the the telltale signs you have late blight is large brown to black spottiness on the fruit as well as on the plant's limbs uh, you can go to your favorite search engine and type in tomato light blight, and you'll see Im immediately what you have, to, what you're dealing with. Now we had this later on in the year. I, I, from what I'm seeing now, we are developing some late blight. The reason why you don't want to compost it yourself or put it in the city pile for them to compost is because late blight, if uh, over the winter, if it, when it gets cold enough here in Wisconsin, the spores will die off, which is what we want. But if you put it in your compost pile or you take it to the city for them to compost, compost piles stay warm. Those spores will stay warm, and then you will introduce those back into your garden if it's in your own compost pile. Or if somebody else has put in the municipal compost pile at the city for, to, for them to pick up during leaf pickup, um, you can go and get that compost, bring it back to your garden, and introduce that late blight, the, those spores, into your garden. So it's best just to put it in the trash. Uh, don't burn it again because that will go in the air and can cause problems down the road as well. But we want to just get rid of it. Once it, there's no, There are some copper fungicides in which you can spray on your plants. If you have late blight, we'll kind of slow it down. There's no known cure for late blight. And uh, it's, a, it's basically a, your plant's going to die. Just get rid of your plants and call it quits and try again next year is essentially what is occurring with your late blight issues. Um, other problems we had, again, we talked about the spontaneous. If you have late blight, you don't want to eat that fruit because those, those spores of that disease is on the fruit. You don't want to eat that. You don't want to can that. You're, you're pretty much done Definitely. Uh, with that. But we had the drought, and that was the, the biggest. I think that's what kind of... Um spiraled everything yeah and 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 as we mentioned we've learned from that and even if we think we're going to have this superbly wet summer we need to we're going to spend the time to put the be irrigation prepared and not yeah. scared essentially yeah we're going to put the irrigation system in a uh, real quick uh what are some uh, we can control spider mites by spraying one was it one tablespoon of liquid seaweed to one gallon of water every two to three weeks on your plants we didn't do this what that does it toughens that, that uh, liquid seaweed, which you can get at your local independent garden center. I believe Blue Mouse carries it. Uh, you can get that. It toughens the leaves. It strengthens the uh, leaf structure, and the spider mites can't bite into the plant, and they go to your neighbor's yard instead. They'll find other plants that they can chew on instead of the tomatoes. Um, but it doesn't kill the spider mites. It just uh, toughens it to where they can't eat the, the plants. They must not be too determined. But to get rid of white flies, yeah, go ahead and you want talk to about do that a uh, soapy water spray. So essentially like uh, a couple drops of dish soap um, in two cups of water or so. And then uh, um, probably about a teaspoon to tablespoon of rubbing alcohol. And now we have, and should, not just tomatoes, we've got white flies uh, on our, our good zucchini plants uh, in the garden as well. And I talked to the neighbor who uh, does a lot of landscaping and garden and flower work, and he said a lot of his clients are experiencing white flies this year more than they ever have before. Oh, so, you know what? I'm sorry. Oh. I said that wrong. So it's a tablespoon of liquid dish soap, and it's a two to five ration of the rubbing alcohol to the water. So if, you, if you're at 32 ounces, then a ta so which is a quart. Uh, quart, then you're going to figure two to five. So uh, unfortunately, that doesn't really work out very mathematically well for 32 ounces. Add more alcohol than you... Th uh, well, add, uh, you necessarily don't want to do that, but just it, kind of... Over, if you ha make the fraction go uh, rounded up. Right. Yeah. So then that is one way, and then you can coat the leaves of the plants you can also use neem oil but you want to make sure you're using cold pressed neem oil top and bottom leaves everything soak it down the whole deal 
Well, we can uh, get that taken care of so we're ready for next year. We can also get our lawns ready for next year if we're tired of doing what we're doing now with the equipment we have. Uh, Aaron's can help us with that. Yeah, do you hear that? Aaron's is helping uh, your neighbor shake in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local lawn dealer, local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. Uh, when we come back, Jane Campbell will be with us. She is a fermentation expert for over 30 plus years. We're going to talk all about fermentation right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu. From apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools, and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. I support by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit Bobex.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. This is not a drill. With your host, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com destination, 1,000 plus videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. And Blue Mel's had a whole lot going on last week, and they can they still have a whole lot going on. We were at the seven, Blue Mel's uh, Landscape Garden Center, the official garden center of the, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, had their seventh annual fall customer appreciation uh, gathering last week. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We didn't even know this was going, well, we knew the festival was, yeah. or the customer appreciation thing was going on but there was a petting zoo there was pumpkin bowling pumpkin painting uh i think that was it yeah, yeah and, and, then and a lot of stuff. Uh, free food yeah and the brats and hot dogs and things like that they've and got then, their kale they got their their decorative fall kale their and they mums. had a lot of their uh like the pots and the the garden decorations, whatever you want to call it, they had those on sale. I'm not sure if they're still on sale. Or if they've already sold out. Or if they've already sold out. Stuff was moving. Yeah. So, um, But, yeah, they have the kale, the mums, the uh, – I think soon they're going to have gourds and pumpkins. Well, obviously they had pumpkins. Um, but, yeah, so definitely – They got bulbs there. Yeah, and bulbs, so. and uh, they do landscape uh, consultation. Uh, you, if you need your land, if you need stuff done, they can do it now. They can give you uh, an estimate on it, what it will cost next year. They can also do landscaping and lawn mowing. So if you're tired of doing lawn uh, cutting your grass, and they'll they have do a, that too. They have a coffee shop. Uh, yeah, Bloom uh, the the coffee Bloom, shop. The Bloom Coffee Shop. Bloom Coffee Shop. Where can we find all this at? Bloom Mills is at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just south of Layton. You can go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. 
Well, Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Jane Campbell has been fermenting in her home for over 30 years. She is the founder and still admins one of the largest fermentation groups on Facebook, Fermenter's Kitchen. She is quite the home fermentation expert. Welcome to the program, Jane. Thank you very much, Holly. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day to join Holly, myself, and all of our listeners to educate us on uh, the fermentation process. Uh, yes. What we talk, we talked about fermentation a couple of weeks from the pro, uh, a couple of weeks ago on the program, but I want you to define what exactly fermentation is. Well, the legal or um, the Google explanation is the breakdown of bacteria and yeast and or other microisms. Um, it's just basically preserving the harvest. Or if you don't garden, you can go to your um, farmer's market and buy um, really nice fruits and vegetables. What is the biggest misconception or misunderstanding about home fermentation? Because a lot of people are thinking, you know, fermentation, beer, wine, cheese, that's pretty much it. But what's the biggest misunderstanding? Well, that um, you're going to get, you're going to kill someone with it, you know, and you don't. Uh, no one's ever died from a ferment. Never. Okay. In the history. It's not just the last 10 years, ever, because... Fermentation has been going on, well, since man, basically. And, and uh, there obviously is some, you know, if you do fermentation incorrectly, you've got that sensory of your nose to say, hey, something's right. not right here. And, and mold. Usually, if you've done it incorrect, you usually get mold, and then the whole batch is trash. And, and we've experienced that. And there's this, and, and for people who are beginning fermentation uh, connoisseurs, um, they will not understand. I mean, they've done all the procedures right. Right, they've done step one through seven perfectly, and they still have problems with the fermentation. It goes moldy or whatever the case, and that's a common occurrence. But is, is there really like, is there a way of telling what you've done wrong, or is it just one of them things that happen? Well, usually with mold, it's usually you have a floater, and it could be a spice. A herb, or even like I'm going to use an example, a sauerkraut could be just a little piece floating on the on the um, brine. And that's why I tell, especially if you're new at it, or even me, I've been doing it for many, 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 many years, um, take it. And if you're really new at it, take it two or three times a week. It takes a second. Go in, wherever it's at, it's on your kitchen table, look at it, no floaters, and then um, just let it go again. And if you're really new at fermentation, I tell people to, to t sample. Sample after a week. The idea is four to six weeks, but you're not going to eat a sour sauerkraut. So what's the point? And every little bit of fermentation adds that much more ba good bacteria to your stomach. Well, let's talk about, uh, for people who are going, okay, I'm interested in fermentation, what tools do I need? Is it expensive to get into this? So, uh, what, no, what, what are the best ways to go about starting a fermentation procedure or, or tools? Sure. I'll go back to when I first started. And it wasn't in back in 81. It was not in. Um, I had an old jar that was used back, back in the 80s. Just everything came in jars, not cans. So I had an older jar that I washed out, of course. And um, you don't have to sterilize. Just make sure it's clean. Make sure the soap is out of it. And uh, a weight can be as simple as a baggie, food grade baggie, filled with brine, and that's all you need besides a knife. Okay, so I I, mean, with the with the jar, we're talking it has to be glass. We can't do this in plastic, or can we do it in plastic? Like a, a um, I don't I don't like plastic only because it can leach in. Okay, I know they have all these ones that say food grade, and there are some of these kimchi ones that have like a little bit of clay in it. Uh, which I know a lot of people have used. Um, it's up to you, really. I and mean, that's what I tell people. It's up to you. If you want to use plastic, go ahead. Um, you know, don't use aluminum. If you've got a stainless steel bowl, you can use that. Don't use aluminum. Um, uh, make sure it's, everything is food grade. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Now, um, you've, and you kind of mentioned how you got started a little bit here with your glass jar, but um, you've been doing this for o over 30 years. How did you get into fermentation, and what is your first starter that you still have to this day? Um, I got into it because my girlfriend was from Germany, but her grandmother came over, and she said, um, she was, my girlfriend did that. 
in English. It was asking anyone who wanted to learn how to make sauerkraut the German way. Well, yeah. And that's how I learned. That was back in 81 or 82, so many years ago. I don't remember. And that's how I got started. Um, and so I've not been doing it ever since. And my oldest um, starter that I've had since the 80s would be my sourdough. Explain explain that for the listeners that, that what the start what's what a starter is and how you're able to keep it alive and going for thirty plus years. It's actually three hundred years old. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I've just had it since the eighties. Um, what it is is flour and water, and you just uh, mix it up. Uh, you mix it up, and you do have to feed it every week, even if you're not using it. Because, like here in Missouri, you know, we're in the close to hundred even now, and so it's just. You just have to feed it, and then what it does is you don't use any store-bought yeast. Everything, the sourdough starter, once it's strong enough, because you can't make them, um, once it's strong enough, it will lift the bread itself. Okay. So there's no, uh, so you don't have to go to a grocery store to buy it. You can just, if you have flour and water at home and some salt and your sourdough starter, that's all you need. Now, for uh, and, and we we kind of direct this towards new fermentation uh, individuals because those who like you, you kind of know what you're doing. Is there something that you would rec? Uh, what what would you recommend somebody if they're going to start f- new with fermentation? What would you recommend that they ferment first? And what would you say? Hey, shy away from this until you really understand the procedure. Um, first, if you're new at it, if you don't like eating it raw, you will not like it fermented. I thought I'd like fermented broccoli because I don't like it raw. I don't like fermented broccoli either. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like fermented cauliflower, but I like it cooked. I'm not cooked. I like it um, raw. Um, the easiest thing, if you want a short ferment, would be your uh, cherry tomatoes. Uh, if you would like a little bit longer one, you start. Just about any ferment is easy, especially in the vegetable category. It's just very easy. And all you need, you know, and it's just time. But, you know, your tomatoes are done in two to three days when it's hot, a little longer when it's not, another day. Um, but it's easy. Don't shy away. Just get that, get, get a good salt. What I mean good salt, something that just, an ingredient just says salt. No caking or anything else. But back even when I started, all we had was a blue box, and that works. It works. Definitely. I know, like, you know, I do a lot of canning, and you want to start with, you know, the the raw ingredients, not a lot of additives, and it is very similar with the things we've done with fermentation. Um, with that being said, if you say you feel that something is off or maybe you're looking for a recipe or somebody wants to try something new, um, I know there's a lot of Facebook groups, um, kind of where what are other good resources where people can find that kind of information? Well, definitely Facebook groups, um, Instagram, um, uh, um, definitely books from your library. I mean, it's sort of, because I tell people, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do this. But as you like it, you might want to add things to it. But, you know, your library, uh, the Facebook is really the biggest, I think, because it's so easy to um, get a whole bunch of people. But just remember, just because you got 15 different answers doesn't mean they're all right. And I think you had mentioned the biggest thing to watch out for is the mold yes. or the, um, the uh, you know, some sort of off smell. Um, yes. That's definitely something to keep in mind. What, what, for, what is the most, uh, in your experience, when a, a fermentation goes bad and there's mold, what have you found to be the biggest contributing factor that this is probably the reason why that mold occurred? Or is there a general uh, answer to that? Something floating on the surface. Okay. That, that's basically what 90% of the mold is. Not always, but 90%. Now, when you get the kiln yeast, which is like a little thin paper thing, which is actually a type of mold, but it's a safe, safe mold. Um, but at the kiln yeast, you can remove that, and that's usually a lack of salt. So, okay, lack of salt. So you kind of, you mm-hmm. really, really got to figure, follow the recipe, and, and, and that's your best opportunity to, to make this successful. Yes, and, you know, watch the salt because, you know, they'll say one tablespoon, but they won't tell you if they're using a fine grind, a medium grind, or a flake. And especially Holly, who does candy, she understands. They're totally different. I like going by weight now. I do do grams. Back in the day, I didn't because I didn't have the scale. 
Now, I yeah. have, um, you know, canning salt. So if one, one does a lot of canning, maybe they have a lot of canning salt. Can they use that canning salt? Of course. Okay. So it doesn't have to be you, iodinized. You, you, what, you, you don't want that. You don't want the, I'm not saying you don't want the blue, but what you'd really like on the label where it says salt. Okay. Nothing else, just salt. So, you, you know, and if, if you don't have it and you have the blue box, use it. I used it for 10 years at least. People that, say you can't use it and all that. You can. That's you can good. use any salt you have. <laughs> that's good to hear. So how, how can we find more info about you? Tell us about your Facebook group um, and how other ways we can connect uh, for the uh, more fermentation in- information that you provide. Well, I, I am on Twitter. Um, I, I don't have the Instagram uh, account. I do have one for my sourdough, but that's it. Um, but it's basically my Facebook group, and then um, I list my um, in my Facebook group, you can uh, have my um, email address, so people can always email me. They can always direct message me. I've always said to the members, you can always get a hold of me, especially when you're getting so many responses and each one is different. Message me. I've been doing this for many years, and I don't mind helping anyone out. And what what is your Facebook group uh, name? From Mentors Kitchen, and ask to join. I do have um, a, a page. And that's totally different. That's where you just like it. But from Inter's Kitchen is my Facebook group. And Jane, we greatly appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your day and sharing some of your fermentation knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. You guys have a great day now. You, uh, you, you as well. Uh, we'll be back right after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Right after this. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Eating natural and organic is not as expensive as it used to be, especially when you shop at Whitman. They have aisles full of certified organic food, from fruits and vegetables to dairy products and even meat, all at great prices. They even have a huge selection of wheat-free and gluten-free items. I can come to Woodman's and get everything I need all under one roof. My name is Alicia, and I shop at Woodman. Hot Shed Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels, offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more, even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotShedMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Wait a minute. Let me have your attention. You're tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee. The listeners are what are making this show possible by you telling your friends that Garden Radio is back on the airways after 11 years. That is what makes us happy. Now back with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX106.5. So happy you've joined us this morning. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, your destination year-round for gardening. A, over 1,000 garden videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, digital, me- 
digital magazines, replay in-studio video and podcast replay of the show. And if you've got a question, you can get a hold of us right now by calling on the Ivy Organics 3-1 Plant Guard Hotline, Holly. Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Guard naturally, naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces. For use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. And you can call them right now with 2414-444-5250. So you, you can also email us at TWVGRadio if you've got a question. You can also tweet us using hashtag TWVG. You can also go to our Facebook page. The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden and submit a question there publicly or privately uh, and we take all that and we also take co comments as we have this week. We got a number of questions came out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube uh, and one was by, from a guest who we had on a couple of uh, about two months ago, uh, Joe Lampo. And if you don't believe this, go to our website or go to our YouTube channel. Uh, it's under last week's show. Uh, Joe Lampo, he's the host of Growing a Greener World on PBS. He's got it. A little and over. He's a, also uh, uh, JoeGardner.com. Yeah, yep. he's, he's got about a million plus follow, uh, million plus viewers a week on PBS on Saturday mornings. He's syndicated in thirteen countries. Uh, he's done over a hundred plus shows, uh, over twelve thousand replays of the show, and the man takes time to watch our program, listen to our, our radio show. And this was the comment he left about last week. Yeah, we're definitely appreciative of that. He said, "Great show, Joey and Holly. Thanks for sharing the story of my bio, my story of bioremediation and my killer compost. Great job, as always, doing your homework and prep. Well done." Well, we appreciate the compliment and the comment, uh, Mr. Joe Lample, and thank you for your support in uh, us and the radio program. We also have uh, the show, you know, we listen, we're live in Milwaukee, and podcast replay and in-studio video replay, which uh, advances our listeners to all over the world. And Brian from the U.K. Uh, com commented on uh, about food waste here in America. Yeah, he said... Um Comment about food waste in America. Our supermarkets sell veggies that don't conform to what we expect as wonky vegetables. Nothing wrong with it, but worth buying because it's cheaper. Um, so he wanted to say that they have the same problem with food wastage in the U.K. Yep. Uh, and and uh, so we appreciate Brian listening and uh, watching in the U.K. Uh, came on our video here. I watched your canning video on making brown sugar peach jam. And that's on the website under the watches tab under the canning what you grow series. Uh, thank you, Holly. Nice job. Uh, easy to understand instructions. Appreciate your effort. So uh, it's always positive when we get. Uh, comments like that not even not so much hey what what's wrong with this or hey can you help me just hey you did a good job means a lot to us we especially like knowing that people learn from yep. us and that's right. our whole goal is to help you uh, allow us to make the mistakes so you don't have to and you can make your first time a success versus us having to do it maybe two or three times <laughs> in order to figure out what we've done wrong um, can I use granular fertilizer in my pump sprayer get it to dissolve and use it as a foliar spray and that is, uh, you cannot do that. No. There are liquid fertilizers in which you can mix in uh, to your f uh, pump sprayers to spray on your leaves, a compost tea, uh, a manure tea, something like that. But granular fertilizer, you cannot get it to dissolve. It has to be broke down by the microbial life in the soil in order for it to be uptakeable by the plant's roots uh, at the time of planting or if you do a, a feed later on during the season. Um, how do I get my pumpkins... How can I get my pumpkins to ripen quicker? I'm concerned that they're not going to ripen before it gets cold. Uh, well, I don't know if there's a way to essentially well, get them to ripen quicker. You, you cut back the plant. Yeah, you can cut back the... the, uh, yeah, the, Gro the growth tip. Yeah. Where the plant is at. If you've got a, a, a vine that's got four or five pumpkins on it, and, and sometimes you have, let's say three. That's a, usually a common number of pumpkins. If you really want them to get ripened quicker, uh, take... Uh, and cut back the growth tip. That growth tip will continue to grow 30, 40, 50 feet until it gets cold and it freezes and frosts and kills the plant. So take back that growth tip, cut it back about a foot beyond that last fruit that is ripening. Now, if you have three pumpkins growing there and two of them are very, very nice pumpkins and one is eh, pumpkin, go ahead and, and snip off that pumpkin that's not very good that's going to reduce the energy going to that pumpkin that plant's going to stop trying to make that pumpkin healthy like the other two and then that will focus the growth by cutting that growth tip back one it's going to stop the growth of the plant and put energy into the development of the fruit and two if you have a pumpkin that is not so great 
remove that, sacrifice that one to, uh, to help the other two grow better and ripen before the frost hits. We did this last year, worked very, very well. I talked about it in the first segment. We had the Jardell pumpkins, mm -hmm. and uh, we thought we were planting white pumpkins. I had a whole bunch of white pumpkin seeds, and I planted the Jardell pumpkins, which I only had two of those, and I thought, okay, this whole season, we're going to get white pumpkins. Well, our niece, Sarah, she's seven, and I said, well, this is going to be... She's six, first of well, all. Well, she was six. No, she's still six. Okay, she's still six. Shows <laughs> what I know. So we, we, she was out looking at, at the pumpkins because she's very... In in, involved in the garden and I said that's going to be a white pumpkin well this was middle of the summer and she goes that's not a white pumpkin that sucker's green <laughs> uh, which it, it turned to be a blue sky blue but she will you, you know you can't get it past oh, her no, no, no. no she will tell you how it is so. uh, but we were happy for the Jardell over the white because the Jardell made the most it makes the most incredible pumpkin pie the smoothness oh it's so it's so uh, good yeah yeah so if you like pumpkin pies definitely look into the Jar Jardell pumpkin the uh, J A R R A H D A L E. I believe that's how it's called. Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. So um, I like to garden as long into the fall as possible. What's the best way to get as many tomatoes to ripen on the vine as I can? Well, there are some some ways. Yeah, we're going to go very deep in this next week uh, in the second segment of the show. But essentially, from the time the flower begins to bloom or open up or develop on the plant to the time the fruit is harvested, based on if it's a large or a fruit or a small cherry or beefsteak, you're looking at 20 to 30 days. So one, you can cut the water off of your plant. That's going to that's gonna be easy because it's not been raining. Uh, that will accelerate the ripeness of your plant. And um, I won't get into too many more details because we've got like six different things you can do next week. Um, you, can, you can cut the growth tips back and some other stuff. But uh, basically cut the water back. If you're watering regularly, cut it back. And that will help speed up the development. That will stress the plant and put the fruit on versus um, not uh, continue watering up to the frost. Yeah. And if, if we do get, you know, threats of a frost, as long as it's not a hard frost, you can certainly cover. And this is covered your, with any tender plants. Right. Any tender plants. You can cover them with um, old bed sheets, uh, you know, row covers, whatever you have, something that's going to protect them from that that light frost because we'll start to get frost warnings probably within the next couple of weeks and then of course it gets warm again and you don't want to go out there and rip all the tomatoes off the vine if you can let them stay there for a little bit longer right this year again we, we you've heard our horror stories about how bad the tomatoes were last year we were harvesting tomatoes it was the wednesday before, well it was the the monday or tuesday before thanksgiving last year is really when we got that first killer frost uh, on no, it, that, that, no, I'm uh, correct. No, the, no, no, it was the like week the before. First, yeah, it, because we harvested our yacons and when the tomatoes were all done at that same time, so it was like the 18th of November is when everything shut down last year. Also, last year in 2016, we were 30 days earlier getting into the garden too. So we had, in our particular area, we had almost 60 days extra growth on everything compared to other places. And this year, we got a late start because it was wet, cold, and muddy, and and things have pretty much burnt up. Um, right now because of the, the, the hot weather and the drought essentially is what we have here. So uh, not every year can be a perfect year. Um, so we still have our pear tree in the front yard. We had hundreds of pounds of pears last year. This year the pears are about half the size as they were. Yeah, but they don't usually get full fully grown until end of October. True, so but just the, the general qua quantity of pears are like 30% compared to the 100%, you know. We'll have to see what happens. Yeah, um, so that, uh, but again, if you have a question, you're more than welcome to send us an email, uh, comment, uh, twvgradio at gmail.com, uh, hashtag twvg, and uh, take a look at um, our videos there. Uh, anything else we need to uh, add there? I don't really think <laughs> okay. so. Okay, uh, this show's brought to you by the fine sponsors, the great sponsors you've heard throughout the program. You can find all of those links under the radio tab on our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Support them because they support us and allow us to be here each and every week. And uh, many of them are coming back next year, already have uh, signed up for season two, just uh, and uh, uh, like our executive sponsor here. Nacelle Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nacelle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it. Because if it's not Nacelle Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nacelle.com. 
Uh, programming note. Jo- programming note. Join us next week. Uh, it's that time of year. The leaves are changing. They're falling. You don't want to put them in the street for the city to pick up to compost in their facility because there's so many beneficial properties that the leaves have that can help your garden, your compost pile, and uh, next summer's uh, mulching capabilities, as well as. Uh, we're going to talk about, as we just briefly teased about, getting your tomatoes to ripen before the frost hits. There's a number of five, six different ways in which you can accelerate that procedure in order for your tomatoes to ripen faster so you can get red tomatoes versus having to ripen them indoors. Uh, and that's not always a fun thing because they don't always ripen when you pull them off the vine green. You can make well, you, what, what, you can make things with the green tomatoes. Uh, Salsa verde. Yeah, yeah. But, but a, a ripe tomato. Fried green tomatoes. A ripe tomato is a whole lot more enjoyable to eat. As well as from Chicago, Illinois, the seed keepers, Carol and Carrie, will be with us. And we're going to go more in-depth uh, to seed-saving techniques and procedures and storage uh, in addition to what we talked about today on the program. We appreciate uh, you listening. And for... Holly Barrett. Well, <laughs> for Holly. Holly Barrett. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm Joy Barrett, and until next week, we'll rehearse and we'll see you in the garden. <laughs>